Hey guys, today we're going to define the kinetic theory of matter and talk about how it affects particles. So the kinetic theory of matter is defined as the forces that exist between molecules as well as the energy they possess. So this theory has both of those in mind at all times. It always includes the forces between the molecules and the energy that the molecules have. Kinetic is a fancy word for motion. You should have learned that in physical science, and we're going to learn that again in physics next year. But just remember, kinetic means that the objects are moving, or the particles are moving. Therefore, we will be comparing the motion and forces between the atoms. So there are three assumptions that must be made for the kinetic theory of matter to hold true. The first assumption is that all matter is composed of small particles. All that means is that the table that you're sitting at isn't just a solid slab of wood or rock or metal. Instead, it is little spheres of atoms making up that table. So all matter is composed of small particles. Those small particles are always in constant motion. No matter what the temperature is, no matter what's happening around them, those particles are always vibrating left to right. Now if it's cold, or if it's a solid, it's going to be vibrating left to right at a slower rate, but as it heats up, the vibrating is going to increase. And the last assumption is that the particles collide with each other as well as the container, but do not lose energy. So a really good way to explain this is if you've ever played air hockey with the air hockey puck, the air pushing up on the puck keeps the puck floating off of the tabletop, so it reduces the amount of friction. So when you hit that air hockey puck, the puck travels around the table at a faster rate and for a much longer period of time than if you hit that puck across the table without that air being on. We're pretending that all particles do that and they just never slow to a stop. Okay, so as you hit it, it's going to bounce and move and transfer energy forever because it is not going to lose energy as it moves. So these are the three assumptions that we assume to be true when it comes to particles and motion. And we have evidence to support these assumptions. So we have three particle diagrams, and we've already done these in class for solids, liquids, and gases, and I'm going to show them to you again. For solids, we have organized and neat and orderly. I think that's 15. For liquids, they spread out a little bit more. Still 15, and gases fill the container. So these are our particle diagrams. We have a solid, we have a liquid and we have a gas diagram all drawn on the same slide. Now remember, when we talked about the states of matter, we said the solids are tightly packed, neatly organized, they move left to right only. The liquids are slightly less tightly packed, they are slightly less organized, and now they can flow freely and the particles can actually move through each other, around each other. And the gases are the most Crazy organized, they are the most spread out, and they are the most energetic. So in order to change our state of matter, we actually have to add thermal energy to a substance. We've already done a lab in class to create one of these diagrams. And during that lab, you placed a beaker full of ice water on a hot plate. And as you turn that hot plate on, you paid attention to what the temperature was in the beaker at any given moment. And we had this type of pattern. Now our graph started about here and ended here if we were lucky. But I'm going to tell you why this is, graph is important and what it means. This first diagonal line, this is where we have solid in the container only. So when we started our lab, we had solid and liquid mixed together. We had water and ice in the same container. So we increase the temperature in this first section when it is a solid only because we are increasing the motion of those particles. Those solid particles are moving left to right very, very slowly. And then as we add heat, they move left to right faster and faster and faster. This horizontal line is where we have solid and liquid mixed. So this is why that our graph started here during our lab. This is where we had ice and water together. And at this section, instead of the ice particles 
speeding up and vibrating left and right faster and faster and faster. Instead, the energy went to breaking the bonds of those particles. So essentially, those two particles of ice of H2O want to stay friends and they want to stay right next to each other, but the energy goes and tries to break that friendship and break them apart. Then once all the particles are broken apart and now they're flowing freely, this diagonal we have liquid only. And again, as we add heat energy, they start moving and flowing at a faster rate. Once we hit this section of the graph, this is where we have liquid and gas. So again, we're still adding energy to the container. Our hot plate is still on, but instead of going to making the liquid move faster and faster and faster, in this section, the energy goes breaking the bonds. So it's breaking those bonds of those liquid particles now, allowing those particles to separate out into a gas. And then this top part is where we would have gas only, which we wouldn't see in a lab because you have to have certain situations to collect the gas after you do this experiment. Okay, so we have this thermal energy diagram, this thermal en energy graph, where time increases and the temperature increases for a little bit and then it plateaus because the bonds are being broken. Then it increases a little bit more and then it plateaus because the bonds are being broken. So in class, I want you to be able to read these and tell me where on the graph we are, what substance is in the container, and what relationships we are looking at. So changing between a solid and a liquid, when we freeze, our energy is decreasing, our energy is going down, and since our energy is decreasing, in this example, we are going to have a high particle attraction. So what that means is as the particles are cooled, they vibrate left to right, and they eventually slow down and vibrate left to right at a much slower rate. And as they slow down, their attraction to their neighbor increases. So when we're melting, the exact opposite happens. Energy increases and particle attraction decreases. So we're heating up the solid substance. It's moving left to right, left to right, left to right. And eventually the energy increases so much that it breaks the bonds between the particles. When we go between a liquid and gas, vaporization is the term that we use for the process of turning a liquid to a gas. It is the general term. So when we turn something from a liquid to our a gas, our energy increases and our particle attraction decreases. When we see condensation, this is when we are turning a gas backwards into a liquid. The energy decreases and the particle attraction increases again. Sublimation is jumping straight from a solid all the way to a gas and here our energy increases a lot so we have a huge jump that we completely skip an entire phase and our particle attraction decreases a lot. And deposition is the exact opposite. We're going from a gas straight to a solid. So our energy decreases a lot and our particle attraction increases a lot. So in class, instead of the phrase particle attraction, I may actually say friendships, because that's essentially what they are. The particles are friends with each other, and we either break those bonds by telling rumors or telling lies by adding energy, or we strengthen those bonds by taking energy away from that substance. So the last thing that I want to talk about is why we can't call changing a liquid to a gas evaporation. Evaporation is a specific type of liquid to gas change. Evaporation only occurs when we go liquid to gas with no added en energy. What that means is you fill a cup of water and forget it on the counter overnight. The next morning you may go to find that cup of water and it's only half full. Or if you have a fish in a bowl on the counter, every few days you have to refill that bowl full of water because the evaporation occurs and that water leaves the bowl and enters the atmosphere. Boiling happens when we have a liquid to a gas with added energy. This means that you are going to be 
putting a pot on the stove to boil water. We are changing from a liquid to a gas, but energy is assisting that change. We're heating it up, we're putting energy into that system in order to make that liquid change into a gas. I do expect you to know the difference between these two, and I do expect you to call liquid to gas vaporization, not evaporation. So tomorrow in class, we're going to practice this a little bit. I will see you then.